Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to episode 43, David Coster Taps Into Your Potential. Here's a shout out to listeners in the United Arab Emirates, specifically in Dubai, those in Wellington, New Zealand, and in the country of Georgia. With that, let's get started. I've known David a number of years. In fact, we worked together at Lowe's Home Improvement in the corporate office. And since leaving Lowe's, we've kept in touch. We both work in the Charlotte area in North Carolina. And David specializes in working with small business owners and even startups in helping them with their standards, onboarding, and talent development. As a performance consultant, David has that unique perspective that can give a lot of insight to his clients, executives that he works with, and I would even say he helps them think systemically about their business and their customers. If you need help managing the performance of your people, contact David. Part 1. Do it right. Too often, we try to save time, money, and even effort by reaching for immediate gratification or trying to do things the quick way just to get it done. Unfortunately, that sometimes comes back to bite us. David shares a brief story with us that describes this better than I could. Here's David. I was working on something in our house and my wife at the time said to me, if you don't take time to do it right, you'll have to make time to do it again. And this was years ago, years and years ago, and I was still a fairly young person, but I think I instinctively knew that. It was always easier for me to look for the shortcut or try to cut corners, even though I'd had situations before that where that shortcut came back to bite me. Just her saying that to me at that particular time really just struck me so much so that 30, 35 years later, it's something that not only do I remember, but it's something that I use very regularly. Think back to situations in my life before and after that episode where I can really remember, yeah, there's a lesson there. When I did it right, it came out better than when I had to do it again. And that can be anything from fixing something around the house to communicating with someone, to writing an email, to working on your car, a thousand different examples of doing it right versus having to do it again. This has become for you a guiding principle for your work ethic. It has. And here again, I can look at some episodes not in too distant past where I've not put in the 100% that I needed to. And uh, an example I'll, I can give for that is I had a VP who was working in a corporate setting. I had a VP send an email asking me to provide her with some business data in addition to some other requests that she had. I responded with the easy parts but sort of skirted over the part that was a little more challenging or that would have required a little more work on my part, thinking, it's not going to matter. I'll I'll get by with this. But no. (laughs) It wasn't an hour later. No, it wasn't an hour later. I got a rather scathing email, which didn't say it in these terms, but I think the tone was, look, I've got lots of important things to do. Asking you something just for the fun of it is not part of my day. If I'm asking you something, it's because I really need to know it for business purposes that are bigger than you or I. (laughs) And um, that made me feel a little small, but it also made me realize this is someone who is doing me a favor and telling me you got to do it right, because if you didn't do it right, I'm going to come back to you and ask you to do it again. So it was really something that always seems to find a way to remind you (laughs) that it's important. Putting it in a a different perspective, when you interact with other people in a business setting or even on a personal setting, in a sense, you're providing services for them. It's almost like you're, you're serving them in some way. And even when you're working on your car, doing something around the house, if you take those shortcuts, you're doing a disservice for yourself. In an unusual way, that work ethics is, a, in a sense, a type of leadership. 
I agree with that. And it really comes into play with the work that I do now, which is really supporting business owners with hiring, recruiting, hiring, onboarding employees, and really developing the processes and tools they need to manage the employee performance within their companies. I find that when they're struggling with an aspect of this performance, employee performance management, I can talk to them in this frame of mind that says, how are you doing it? Are you doing it the right way, the best way possible? And if not, what are the consequences? And they realize that the consequences of not doing it right is they have to do it again. Yeah. We all know that having to recruit and hire employees is a lot of work. It's expensive. It really has a a big impact on business progress. And so it comes into play there. And I find it really resonates with the people that I work with because they're able to see it for themselves. And beyond just the recruiting and hiring process, it really can permeate the entire management process because if the employer isn't prepared for being an employer and supporting their employees, then it can create opportunities for breakdowns in those relationships over a long period of time that have greater impact on the business than just not making a a good hire by itself. As you were saying that, what came to my mind was that you're in the business of helping people develop this work ethic where they may take a process for granted and just assume you know, for example, that people understand it, but you might come in and say, look, you need to document this. You need to ensure clarity and help them make it right, so to speak. I like that. As you say it, I recognize that too. I agree with you. I like that you said that. Part two, discovering unexpected opportunities. So often in life, there's small acts that people do or just things that people say that can have a fundamental effect on our outlook and our direction and even change our career path. In other situations, we might make a small gesture or offer someone some help in a way that they don't expect without intentionally making such a profound change. In this story, David shares with us something that an owner did that changed the lives of three young boys. Here's David. When I was a teenager, probably 14 or 15 years old, the street that I lived on was near Interstate 80 in in, uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. The intersection at the top of of our street had three gas stations on, on three of the four corners. And as kids, we would go up to the gas stations with our nickels and dimes and for sodas or candy out of the machines and We'd go to one or the other of the gas stations. And I got to remember, this is back when gas stations were not convenience stores. Yeah. They sold gas and had bays where cars were repaired and they, they sold tires and fixed tires and things like that. So it was going back a few years. But we would go up to these gas stations and hang around. Two of the gas station owners or managers were not all that friendly about it. They didn't really want a bunch of neighborhood kids hanging around. One of the guys, Bill's Texaco, uh, was owned by a guy named Bill Stoltz. The neighborhood kids would go up there and get our candy and sodas. And eventually we'd go up there and just start hanging around. And as we were getting a little older, we were all really into cars. So hanging around at a service station was like a playground for us. So I think what Bill started to realize, if these kids are hanging around, I need to keep them out of trouble and give them something to do. So he'd say, if you're just going to hang around here, why don't you make yourself useful? He said, I'll give you two bucks to paint the curbs or take out the garbage or organize the storeroom or just something that we could be useful. So as time went by and we got older, some of us realized there was a real opportunity for us to make a, a job out of this or to really connect with Bill and the business that he's in. Some of us hung around enough and did enough and looked at Bill as, I'm not going to say a father figure, I mean, that might be too dramatic, but at least a caring individual, a caring adult who had something to offer us in exchange for what we were offering him. I would describe Bill Stoltz as a mentor. Maybe he wouldn't call himself that. In a sense, he's giving you and your friends 
purpose. And you're instead of just saying living life as it is and just doing things, you're actually are saying, wait a minute, there's something here that I can make a contribution. It may not change the world, but I get a, a sense that is what Bill is instilling, whether he meant to or not. For sure. I'm thinking three of us, my friend Tom, my friend John and me, he gave us jobs, real jobs, pumping gas, simple mechanical tasks, and a chance to learn a a trade, if you will. What it did for my own situation, it led me to go to school for auto mechanics. When I come back, this is going away to Williamsport, Pennsylvania. When I came back, Bill had a job waiting for me in the summers to work in in a station, working on cars. That's right. You, you became a master mechanic, right? Well, I wouldn't say master mechanic, but I certainly was. <laughs> Wait, let me rephrase it. So you had formal education around doing mechanics with automobiles. Yes, I did it for 10 years. And my friend John, who was in the same group, ended up going into business, buying part of that gas station with Bill. As Bill opened up another gas station across town, he needed us to work there too. And so we really became kind of the centerpiece of his business. And we were kids, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. And it really um, gave us focus and direction and somebody that was doing things for us, as I said, in, in, in exchange for us doing things for him. It ended up that eventually he left or sold that business and went to work at a Mita shop in our town. I moved away for a couple of years and came back and he asked me to come back to work for him at the Mita shop. It was an ongoing support. You know, I felt like we had a great working relationship. And I remember I was in, I went back to uh, get my bachelor's degree a little later in life after my automotive career. And I remember being in a writing class. And one of the questions was write about someone who was instrumental in your life. And I wrote the whole story about Bill Stoltz. And so again, you know, you're talking 40 some years later, and it's still a meaningful part of my life. I thinking back to the two owners that were on the same corner who were in Friendly, if Bill ended up being like them, who knows where you would be? Yeah. Where, where you would have been, but it definitely, he gave you, he gave John a, a purpose to doing something you enjoy. Yeah, it was absolutely giving us the outlet for things we wanted to do anyway. It was just such a gift. We were kids in a candy store to be around cars, to be able to take our own cars up there and work on them at night and just learn something that for each of us was uh, a good living for, for quite a few years. Kids in a mechanical candy store. (laughs) Yeah, I would say that that's, those are lessons that again, I've taken not only for myself, but as I've moved into the, the business world and as a teacher myself to learn that everyone has something they can contribute, but most of us need someone to give us an opportunity or some guidance and encouragement. I said, everyone needs a champion. And I think that um, when you come into someone's life when they're young, and this is for business people, for teachers, for parents, you know, you're doing someone a great favor that sometimes you have no idea. I don't think, I haven't seen Bill in 35 years. I, I don't know that he has any idea I'm talking about him right now. I'm sure he doesn't. When someone believes in you and you're the recipient of the belief, it can change your life. Part three, it is okay to ask. Let's face it, the COVID-19 pandemic has uprooted lives and really changed things. It has given us a new perspective of what volatile means. And yet some people, they fared pretty well during the pandemic and didn't seem to be affected by what was going on other than, well, let's just say they've adapted better than some of us. However, regardless if we're in a pandemic or not, people have challenging times, and they sometimes really need help from other people. When we're faced with difficulties, David has some advice for us. Again, here's David. We live in a society that values winners and positivity, Yeah, even when that's not what's really happening. We're living in challenging times. It's very cliche to say that, I think it's okay, and I think it's important to become comfortable sharing our concerns and needs in life. A lot of times it's said as being vulnerable. For myself, being an introvert, being maybe a little bit more subdued or emotionally driven, having challenges in my life, 
sometimes I feel like it's not safe to be that way because we're in the society that seems to primarily value winners and positivity above all else. But I think it's important that we're able to share when we have problems or when we have needs or when we just want some support from others. Because otherwise, how will people know where they can help you? I see that as kind of a dichotomy that we want people to be strong and buck up, stick up, stiff up your lip and all that. But then so many of us want to be helpers. Hey, let me know how I can help. Well, if we don't tell people that we need help or how they can help us, I think the obvious conclusion to be drawn is, well, they don't need any help. So I'm not going to ask them. I'm not going to bother them. I'm not going to push and pry. And then we go without getting that help or support we might need. I think the former of what you were saying, the stiff upper lip, for example, that using that phrase is such a myth nomer or a myth about how we're supposed to be. I just recently heard a story on another podcast where someone had terrible writing and just misspelled words. And this is decades ago. And he had to go to the, why we call it, the principal's office, but he went to HR and they said, your spelling is terrible. And you need to do something about it. You need to go back to school or something like that. And he finally eventually said, look, I have dyslexia. Mm. And then HR was like, oh, okay. Well, that's all right. That's fine. I understand. We can work with that. <laughs> and it became okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> to the other point that you're making is that they're wanting to help. They're willing to meet you where you are. But if we're not using the word you said, vulnerable enough to take the risk and say, this is what's going on with me, then no one will be able to help you. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, there's a fine line between being a constant complainer and someone who's genuinely reaching out with a need. But I think there's there's value in sharing our experiences. I mean, the commiserating, especially now, is valuable because we're all going through things we don't understand and we can't put words to. And if we're up at night just tossing and turning and we really understand why, it's, it's not going to resolve itself in most cases. So I just think that there's a tremendous value in accepting that and realizing that we're not the only people that are going through that, the only person who's struggling or challenged, and let's come together and help each other where we can. Ronald Graves, who's sort of like my um, coaching expert that I go to, mm -hmm. he's also my executive coach or <laughs> my life coach or whatever you want to call it. He said, we, we were talking about blogs. And I've been doing blogs for a while. We were talking about content and he actually got out of his role and he said, look, Gary, I'm going to tell you something about blogs. People don't want to hear how great you are or how well you do something or how well you accomplish something, how many millions of books or articles or you know whatever it is that you've done. Blah, boring. What they want to <laughs> hear, it's the real stuff. They want to hear it when you mess up when you make mistakes because they can identify with that so much mm -hmm. better and how you dealt with it. All the stuff you hear about Facebook, about people who put this false front where they make everything sound better than it really is, is just, like I said before, blah, but put it out there. And people all over the world, they suffer, they have challenges, there's people that are depressed. The more we're open with that, the more we can help and support one another. Bring a little humanity back to where it's needed the most. My thanks to David Koster. If you'd like to learn more about David, go to the show notes. And if you'd like to leave a comment or question, go to unlabelleadership.com, click the message icon, and you can leave a voicemail up to one minute. Maybe I'll play it on the air. I'd like to thank those who contribute to the show financially. Your contributions help with the production expenses. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you, the listener, for just doing that, listening. Until next time, lead on.